Hey, I'm Ignati Vishnevetsky. Hello, AV Club. We are here with Danny Boyle, director of T2, Train Spotting, many other films. I think generally when, when people picture an image from a Danny Boyle movie, I, I think it's usually of people running. I think whether whether the, the things that stick with yeah. people, whether it's the opening of the original Train Spotting or it's something like 28 Days Later. I feel like there's a lot of running in your films and uh, and that it's as much, perhaps as much literal as it is metaphorical. You would think about it because obviously the the, in the first film, that opening sequence of the first film is pretty, it's quite famous now in a way that kind of like haunts you. So if you ever have running in a movie, you've got to think, oh my God, yeah, is it going to be the same as in Trainspotting or not? Um, I like momentum, like really genuinely, I'm addicted to it. In, and I also believe the art form of cinema is, ext it defines the art form of cinema. Two things divide the art, for me, define the art form of cinema, which is momentum which is this cons and it used to be, the cameras are different now, of course, but it used to be literally, mm -hmm. uh, to watch a film, you were watching a series of still pictures forced through a projector at enormous speed. You know, literally the act itself was momentum, was forward momentum. And that reflected, I think, in the stories, in the way we, especially mainstream cinema, but also time is an extraordinary art form of time because you can speed up that momentum, stretch it, you can stop it, freeze it, there's no other art form could do that kind of stuff. And people who sit in the cinema have given you, and they've paid for it, they've given you two hours of their time. I mean, which other art form does that, where they go, here you go, I'm gonna sit in this room, I'm not gonna talk to anyone, I'm not gonna wander around, nothing. I'm just gonna sit still, that's it, you've got me for two. I mean, it's like those seem to me to define cinema, really. And I, and I think back to the origins of cinema and where it came from, which is working people who are obl obliterated by work would sit in a darkened room and watch a train come towards them and scream as a way of relief from the burden of their lives. I mean, I connect with that. I don't make those huge, huge movies, but I love watching them and I, I, and I understand they are the kind of mountain around which we gather, you know? Well, there's kind of a beautiful contradiction to the idea of a medium where people pay to sit and be quiet and watch other people talk and run around. Yes. But there's something a little bit, I think because of that, uh, it seems to me like such a central theme for you or a motif, there is something perverse about making a film about characters returning, uh, having escaped in this case. Indeed, yeah. Um, sort of reverting back to the past. Yeah, there is a pullback. And, it, and, it, and it obviously the, the film is a lot concerned with nostalgia, not as a sentimental item, but actually as a force that's impossible to ignore. Mm -hmm. And for reasons that you see at the beginning of the film, Renton returns to Edinburgh. Uh, and Edinburgh that he's left with his friend's money, mm -hmm. you know, as he's vanished to Amsterdam. Well, they know not where, but it, was, it, it turns out to have been Amsterdam. And he's not even returned for his mother's funeral, you know? Not even that has brought him back, but something else brings him back, that forces him back. And the past is alive in all of us, is alive in all four of them. And uh, unusually, actually, it, and it, well, it's not unusually because they're, they're not really social realist films. Mm -hmm. They're realistic and painful sometimes, but they're not social realism because none of the four have met each other in, in that 20 years, even though three of them live in the same town mm -hmm. still. And, I mean, one of them's in jail, one of those three is in jail anyway, but they haven't been to visit him in jail or anything like that. So the four of them, they kind of wait for the movie, in a way, to reignite the chemistry of their friendship, which is both wonderful to experience, and they, they do try to relive some of the glories of the past, so you do get that sense of, you know, the, the great side of nostalgia, which is, hey, we're the good times, and also they realise that they can't keep doing that for, for you know, in, in their mid forties, you know, theme of these characters changing. They're in some ways trying to to recapture some of that energy. I, I, I think of the the sequence where they basically crash this sectarian gathering, where they're almost <laughs> lapsing back into this this sort of subversive energy that they have in the first film. But it seems to me like. Obviously, the city that you're portraying is changing, and I know that the, <laughs> there's a, there's a, there's some EU funds that play a role in this plot. That uh, obviously, in light of in light of Brexit, seem uh, very ironic. Yeah, yes, yeah, very, very ironic. Especially as regards Scotland, because we we were in Scotland shooting. We were when the vote happened. So, mm -hmm. and the double irony was that uh, Scotland, of course, voted overwhelmingly to remain in the EU. Mm -hmm. In contrast to the rest of the UK which voted to leave. So the natural um, consequence of that will be, I think, 
that Scotland will leave the UK. It will choose Europe over England any day, I think, because it's the Scots don't really like the English very much anyway. There's been a since 1707 and the Act of Union, there's been some tension mm -hmm. between them. And, and as a Brit, I'm, an, I'm English, so going to work in Scotland, you are aware of that. You know, they, you, know you can't behave like an Egypt. Otherwise, they'll give you, they'll kill you. You know, it's like you have to, you have to behave, you know, appropriately to being in Scotland and uh, to the great traditions and cultures of Scotland. So, yeah, ironically, they will. Although they, there is EU, EU money in the film, it remains unresolved. As, as a plot point, as, as, a, as plot a plot point, point, and it remains unresolved. Actually, what happens to that money at the end? So maybe there's more to come from all that. You know, but it's it's interesting because it is it gives it a a fairly large you could say economic reality to uh, to a film that's about fairly small economic realities, about these characters just struggling to get a little bit of money, trying to get this uh, this quote unquote bar up and running. Uh -uh. You know, these these smaller sort of dingier form of economics. And then you've got these the huge economic forces going on on top. Economics in their world mm -hmm. are an opportunity to betray each other, really, which is what they were in the first film. And it's certainly what they are in this next film. And they, they try to, kind of relive this cycle of opportunity and betrayal. And in fact, ironically, it's another element of the modern economy of Scotland. Mm -hmm. A young woman from Eastern Europe, and Scotland is full of young, uh, migrant workers from Eastern Europe, takes advantage of their foolishness, really. Well, there's, there's a moment where Renton arrives, he returns back from Amsterdam, and he is greeted by a Slovenian woman in a kilt handing out... Uh, yeah handing out brochures f about Scotland, presuming that he is a he is a tourist. But he is in a sense, it's a slightly, there's a line I think in the film where somebody says you're a tourist in your own past. Yeah, no, he is. I mean, the city has changed. It's, I mean, it's, some of its architecture hasn't, it can't. It's a medieval and a Georgian city. But actually the nature of the city has changed. It's a much younger city, ironically, mm -hmm. given that he's in his mid forties returning. There's been a huge student influx into the town since we made the first film. Mm -hmm. So that up to a quarter of the town's population now is a young student population. So there's a vibrancy about it which was not there before. And it's ironic, these older guys returning. There is a meta irony, as of so many in this kind of film, which is a lot of people said that the reason the student population has exploded is because of the first film. Everybody thought, oh, that looks like a good place to study, let's go there, and they all end up in Edinburgh. Well, it doesn't necessarily have the happiest portrayal of that city, but sometimes it's it's the scuzz that it's, draws. Yeah, the energy, uh, yeah. So speaking of meta ironies, I mean, you're making a film about someone basically returning to their old relationships from 20 years ago. And it's a sequel to a film you made 20 years ago. With I, I understand there was a time when you and you and McGregor yeah. drifted apart for quite a while. Yeah, and we should have. what we should have done is exactly what he and Sick Boy do when they re-meet, which is had a fight and hit each other with pool cues and get it out in the open. But we didn't, of course, because we're British and we kind of like tend to sit in our corner and sulk a little bit and not say anything about emotion generally. But we did eventually thankfully, and we were able to make this film again. This was a project that was in the works for a while. I remember there was some talk about it back almost in the mid 2000s. So did it, did its conception have to change a lot? Because say, if you were originally thinking of revisiting the characters 10 years later, now you're revisiting them 20 years later. It wasn't so much that it changed, it became, it was the only way that it made sense really to do it now. Mm -hmm. We, You're right, we tried it 10 years ago and it wasn't, it was not good. We didn't even send it to the actors. It felt like a rehash, mm -hmm. like just basic, which sequels can be, you know, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but it didn't feel like it would, we would do honor to the first one if we just rehashed it. Mm -hmm. And it was just a caper, really a slightly different caper, but everything was the same, basically. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the actors didn't even look that different. And I used to joke as an excuse then that they moisturized and they looked after themselves and they didn't seem to age. There was a bit of the Dorian Gray about actors and stuff like that. But actually it was, I realized that it was John and I, the screenwriter who weren't ready to actually make a decent film yet. And it was only after a true reckoning amount of time, 20 years passed and went, and they also turned and they did, and the actors did look different, that that gave us a reason to make the film. Cause then it's the tension between what they'd done before and where they were now. Whereas there really wasn't any in that shorter period, you know? For a lot of people, Train Spotting was the film that, that sort of first attracted their attention to your name. So obviously you've had a lot of your career since then. Do you feel differently about the original, the original film, going back to the, the subject matter 20 years later, going back to some of its ideas? Do you feel like it was a chance to address something? What I tried to inherit mm -hmm. 
from the original was the, the principles of the way we made it, which we, we, we made it really as a co-op. It was a bunch of kind of equal people. And we did, we mirrored that on this film. Everybody was paid the same and which wasn't a great deal of money. You know, they get back end equally if it's a success, but it was, it was, the, it was a sense of a, a, um, a project, uh, an ambition rather than a, rather than a cash in really. And, and I, uh, and one of the other principles I inherited, tried to copy from the first film, was that we made as many decisions as possible as late as possible. Because mm. I remember doing that, that we only made them when the actors were in the room, really. Now, you can make a film without the actors, virtually, and then you bring them in to just do what you tell them. That leads usually to unhappy actors, mm. you know, for, for understandable reasons. They've just been moved around like mannequins. Um, but what we'd done on the first film, and we tried to on this, was actually get the let the ideas of the way that we film emerge out of their participation in it as well. And I think it has a, it has sort of has a quid pro quo thing that happens, is that that encourages them to feel a kind of ownership and they begin to push themselves a bit. And so their performances get bigger because what's interesting about both films is that these are not like mumblecore realism. Mm -hmm. They're quite big presented films with big, <laughs> big scenes in them, you know? They, there's no kind of like taking it easy and making sure they just say the lines and which you can do on movies and just potter through them. This is like presented, you know, you're, you're in for a ride straight away. Even though this one is a slightly more reflective one than the first one, I suppose, because of the nature of time having passed. One big sort of collaborator you've acquired in that in that time, to my mind, is Anthony Dodd Mantle. Um, so, uh, re returning with him, as I feel like he's a he's a uh, there's there's a point there's 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 a creative um, I I don't know what the word is, but I feel like he has a, he has a certain juice that he uh, that he that he brings. Uh, I'm very lucky. I mean, Anthony's one of them. Mm -hmm. I'm very lucky to have a series of partnerships with, and that's how I think of them as partnerships, really. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of these people, like my, the designer I work with, Mark Tilsley, and the editor, especially on this film, John Harris, and they're, they are like mini directors. They just don't want the ultimate responsibility. For whatever reason, it's a personality thing, usually. They so do you think you're the fall guy? Is that is that what it comes well, down to? Well, if it goes wrong, like, obviously I do, yeah. But no, you, you, I benefit from them, because you get a kind of almost like a fully fledged series of directors working with you with their kind of ideas and, and you know, they're, 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 they're constantly kind of prompting you, you know, and, and everybody has bad days when you're kind of like below your best. And when you're surrounded by people like that, they're the compensation for it in a way. So I've been very lucky like that and hence trying to nourish those partnerships and Anthony's one of them, as I said, and, and John Harris on this one, because this, this was particularly a, a film that grew in the editing. You know, sometimes they grow on the floor, like Slumdog Millionaire was very much a, a floor film. It was made as we were shooting it, you know. And not, it was very well edited and everything like that, but the key stage was being in Mumbai filming it. This one, not so much. It was actually, we had a lovely time shooting it, but it was the editing that was extraordinary, where you worked out this relationship with the original film. And, and also, which I wasn't aware of when we were doing it, even in editing, the relationship with the audience. Because, because people knew the first film, and knew, because it was a staging pulse for them, for so many people, people talk about it like, oh, I remember when I saw it, I remember who I was with, all this kind of stuff. There's a conversation going on between the two films and the audience, which I've never known before, because normally you present a film and you're constantly introducing it to people, because mm -hmm. they know nothing about it, and you're trying to ease them into the film. This one, everybody had an opinion at the beginning, quite clear opinion whether this was a good idea or not, but here they were to have a look at it, you know? So that was interesting, you know, that's a different dynamic with your audience, which I'd never experienced before.